Uh, today I'm very pleased to be here to be able to talk to you about joint work with Yapa Boss from N NXP Semiconductors and Craig Costello and Michael Nerig from Microsoft Research, uh, where we investigated how we might eventually use post-quantum cryptography in internet protocols. So as you know, uh, the typical cipher suite in TLS uses both symmetric and asymmetric public key primitives. Uh, for example, with RSA signatures for authentication, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman for key exchange, and then uh, symmetric cryptography like AES and SHA for uh, encryption and authentication. Security of the public key schemes is based on the difficulty of number theoretic problems like factoring and discrete logarithms. Uh, now, we don't know how to solve these problems efficiently uh, with computers we have today, but on a quantum computer, uh, with operations based on the principles of quantum mechanics, uh, we could solve these problems efficiently. Okay, so that raises the question, uh, when, if ever, will we have quantum computers? Well, that's, that's a million dollar question, and physicists are working on it. Uh, they won't predict a date, uh, but they continue to make progress. Um, and the best current experiments can do basic tasks, like operate on single physical qubits, or perform operations on multiple qubits, or even some error correction. However, uh, they haven't made all the way to a full quantum computer. This progress earlier this year bringing us to around the fourth stage of this seven stage roadmap. Um, but there are several stages to go until they achieve fully fault tolerant quantum computation. Uh, there's no clear timeline, but at this point there's also no evidence that building a quantum computer is impossible. So it's worth thinking about how we'll secure our communications um, if and when there are large scale quantum computers. This motivates the field of post-quantum cryptography, or quantum safe cryptography. Uh, there are several mathematical primitives which seem to be hard for quantum computers, including problems based on error correcting codes, hash functions, multivariate quadratic polynomials, and lattices. Uh, these problems haven't been studied quite as much as factoring and discrete logarithms, so there are a lot of research questions to address before they're ready for use in applications today. Uh, for example, what are the best attacks, either by classical computers or quantum computers? And how does that translate into parameter sizes? Uh, once we've calculated parameter sizes, what key sizes does that lead to? Are they sufficiently small? And can we do the operation sufficiently fast? Uh, and finally, how do we actually use these in systems? How do we modify our existing systems to make use of these new techniques? So in this work, we sought to answer these three of these questions for one post-quantum candidate, the ring learning with errors problem. So I'll tell you a little about this problem and then our results uh, on testing out this primitive. So first off, uh, the premise. Uh, we'll assume that large-scale quantum computers don't exist right now, uh, but they might eventually, and so we want to protect today's communication against a potential quantum adversary in the future. This is kind of a transitionary approach. Uh, now, from this premise, it follows that it's okay to use traditional primitives like RSA or elliptic curves for signatures, because we only need authentication to be secure right now when we actually establish the connection. It's the keys, the session keys, that we need to be secure in the long term. So we need to do key agreement using a post-quantum algorithm. And this is where ring learning with errors comes in. So the learning with errors problem, let me tell you about the basic mathematics. Start off with a really simple problem uh, from first year linear algebra, solving systems of linear equations. So if I give you a, a blue matrix and uh, I multiply it by a red vector, and then I give you the following, the outcome, the blue vector on the right hand side of the slide. So I give you the two blue things, the blue matrix and the blue vector, and ask you to find the red vector. Well, that's pretty simple. Uh, that uses Gaussian elimination, row reduction. So it's not a hard problem that's suitable for cryptography but we can easily turn it into a harder problem. So we'll start again with a matrix, and we'll multiply it by our secret red vector. Then we'll add a little bit of noise uh, to get the final result. Now, if I give you the blue matrix and the blue vector and ask you to find the red vector, that's the learning with errors problem. Now, a, uh, pr in practice, we need to use larger values than the toy example on the left-hand side. Uh, so we might need to use a matrix that's you know, 640 rows by 256 columns with entries that are 12 bits long. So we need keys that are about 245 kilobytes. Unfortunately, uh, this is too large for many systems. 
Uh, so the primary goal of ring learning with errors, a variant of this learning with errors problem, is to reduce key size. And the way it does so is by introducing structure. Okay? So we do so by using a specially structured matrix where each row in the matrix is the cyclic shift of the row above. Then there's a special wrapping rule that modifies values as they're wrapped around. But once I know that the matrix is constructed in this way, I now only have to tell you the first row, saving a whole lot of communication. You can construct the rest of the matrix. So there's, uh, sorry, there's one more variant now uh, to rephrase this as a problem involving a polynomial ring. So I work in a polynomial ring with coefficients being integers modulo a base Q, and the polynomial is being reduced modulo another polynomial. And the problem is as follows. I pick a random polynomial, I multiply it by a secret polynomial, and add a small noise polynomial to get a result. And the ring learning with errors problem is, given the, blue the two blue polynomials, the starting polynomial and the resulting polynomial, find the red polynomial. Finally, we use one more particular variant called the decision ring learning with errors problem with small secrets. There are two changes going on here. First, uh, we use a small secret, a small red vector, rather than a uniformly random red vector. And second, the task is not to recover the secret, but just to distinguish the outcome vector from random. So the decision ring learning with errors problem, given the blue vector, and either the green vector or a random, uniformly random polynomial, decide which you're given. And you can think of this as an analog of the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. So now this problem is related to the difficulty of solving a particular problem, the shortest independent vector problem on ideal lattices, which is why we sometimes say this is a lattice-based problem, even though the arithmetic is actually involving polynomials. Uh, and there's a polynomial time reduction uh, to this hard problem. Uh, and a problem that we believe to be hard for quantum computers as well. In practice, we assume that the best way to solve this is by solving the learning with errors problem, uh, which involves generally solving a lattice reduction problem. Uh, and based on the best known attacks, um, we can estimate what kind of parameter sizes we would need for this problem to be hard. Uh, for 160-bit security against a classical attacker, which would translate into at least 80-bit security against a quantum attacker using the best known algorithms, uh, we do need larger coefficients than in the toy example, but not too large. We need our polynomials to be about 1,024 coefficients, and we need each coefficient to be a 32-bit integer. And that adds, uh, that adds up to about a 4-kilobyte representation. So that's the ring learning with errors problem. Let me now tell you how we make this into a key agreement protocol. Okay. So we're going to try to design a Diffie-Hellman-like key agreement protocol from the ring learning with errors problem. And this is a reformulation of the ring LWE key encapsulation mechanism presented by Pikert at post-quantum crypto last year. So there's a global polynomial A, kind of like the generator in the Diffie-Hellman problem. Alice picks a random secret S and some noise E and computes her public polynomial B equals A times S plus E. Then Bob does the same and they exchange these values. Finally, they compute a shared secret. Alice multiplies Bob's polynomial by her shared secret, and Bob does the same on his side. Uh, now, the problem is that these values are approximate. They use some noise here, and so they only have approximately equal values, not exactly equal values. And of course, approximately equal values are useless in cryptography, so we need to do some kind of correction, rounding. Uh, but fortunately, it's a cl clever way to do that in Pikert's paper. The basic idea is to round each coefficient of the polynomial independently towards a single bit. Um, in particular, we're going to round things that are close to zero to zero. So things that are between q on 4 and negative q on 4 will round towards zero. And things that are closer to q on 2 will round in that direction, giving us a 1. Now, this works fairly well, but not perfectly. The probability of failure is about 1 in 1,000. Um, now, if you remember, we have 1,000 coefficients in our polynomial, so probability of failure 1 in 1,000 is actually too high, and we need something better to get exact key agreement. Okay. So this is where uh, there's a, a more clever approach. 
uh, where Bob sends some additional information along with the rounding information. Uh, and this is which region of the circle Bob's value is in, either the green regions or the red regions. And then if Bob's value is in the green region, uh, one particular rounding rule applies. And if Bob's value is in the red region, a different rounding rule applies. And then with this additional information, uh, the probability of a failure is much lower. In particular, if the two values that are, they're rounding are within Q on eight of each other, then this always works. So we just need to bound the probability that these values are that close. Uh, and fortunately, it turns out to be doubly exponential. So there's absolutely, uh, in practice, no chance that we'll ever have uh, this happen. And in fact, security as well is not affected. Revealing which region the value is in leaks no information about the final result. So this allows us to do a exact, uh, or with very high probability, exact key agreement protocol. Okay? So coming back to our diagram now, in the protocol, Alice and Bob exchange their, shared, their, public, secret, their public keys, and Bob sends along this additional rounding information. They perform the rounding operation at the end, and they establish a shared secret. And this problem, this key exchange, is secure if the decision ring learning with errors problem is hard. Okay. So now we have a basic Diffie-Hellman-like key agreement protocol, and we can try uh, seeing how it actually works in practice. So we looked at integrating this into the TLS protocol to see what its behavior would be like in that practical environment. So first, we designed uh, two new cipher suites uh, using either RSA or ECDSA signatures for authentication. Remember, we only need authentication to be secure now. We need our key exchange to be secure into the future. And then AES for authenticated encryption. Uh, in terms of the security of this cipher suite, uh, we proved it in the authenticated and confidential channel establishment model, which we heard about yesterday as a security model that's suitable for analyzing secure channel protocols like TLS and QUIC. Uh, for those of you interested in uh, ACCE security and provable security of these protocols, uh, there's an interesting little uh, tidbit here. Um, the TLS signed Diffie-Hellman proof uses the Oracle Diffie-Hellman assumption. Uh, but those Oracle-like assumptions don't hold in the lattice-based setting. So we actually have to make a slight change in the protocol, moving the server's signature to later in the message flow. But once we do that, uh, we have that security can be, pro can be proven. Uh, then we looked at implementing it. We wrote a constant time standalone implementation in C, as well as a non-constant time one. Uh, we wrapped that up in OpenSSL's libcrypto library, and finally into OpenSSL's libssl library, so we could test it out inside Apache. Uh, the raw crypto operations uh, have the following performance characteristics. Uh, key generation is, uh, sorry, uh, so the top of the table shows the ring learning with errors operations. At the bottom, you can see the corresponding operations for OpenSSL's implementation of the NIST P256 elliptic curve. And overall, we can see that ring learning with errors runtime is a little bit slower than OpenSSL's elliptic curve implementation, about 1.75 times slower. Uh, this is a somewhat significant performance gap in the raw operations, uh, but when we look at the performance in the context of the full TLS protocol, uh, it's not quite as bad uh, because of the cost of the additional operations in TLS. So a server using ECDSA signatures and either ECDH or ring learning with errors key exchange uh, has this performance, the number of operations it can support per second. Um, and there's only a 25% performance gap here because the additional cost of the encryption and digital signatures. Um, and the performance gap decreases as we increase the size of the transmitted data. Uh, the ring learning with errors key exchange does add to the handshake size, about eight kilobytes, uh, but perhaps that's not too much for some applications. Uh, when we switch to RSA signatures for authentication, if we wanted to migrate today, certificate authorities are using RSA signatures, the performance gap narrows even because of the added performance penalty of RSA signatures. Finally, we looked at a hybrid cipher suite where we used both elliptic curve and ring, ring learning with errors key exchange. Uh, you might wonder why we'd want to do this. Um, well, we have a little bit less confidence in the ring learning with errors parameter sizes right now, because we know how these attacks are going to scale or improve with practice. So if we wanted to be cautious about uh, cryptanalytic attacks against ring learning with errors, but have the potential for quantum safety, we might use both a quantum safe algorithm 
in an existing algorithm, so at least we're no worse off than having used our current algorithms today. Um, and again, the performance uh, is impacted by doing this hybrid approach, but not too badly. So just to wrap up, uh, we've taken a look at some initial attempts at using post-quantum algorithms for key exchange. Uh, we've seen how we can use ring learning with errors in TLS with pretty good performance. The key sizes are not too bad. There's a small performance overhead. Um, but I should mention a very important caveat. These ring learning with errors assumptions haven't been studied as much as existing assumptions. So cryptanalysis might improve, and parameter sizes may have to evolve. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in this area, uh, in ring learning with errors and quantum safe crypto uh, more generally. Uh, better cryptanalysis, which leads to better par parameter size estimates, uh, faster implementations, uh, constructing efficient key exchange and digital signature algorithms from other post-quantum assumptions, and other work. Uh, a full version of the paper with the proof is available on the ISCR ePrint archive. Our code is available online for you to experiment with or improve. Thanks very much for your time. All right, as people are coming up with questions, uh, I had a quick question for you, Douglas. Uh, so you mentioned several other post-quantum assumptions at the beginning of your talk. Um, do you have a sense for how they would compare? Are they sort of much larger parameters, much worse assumptions compared to ring learning with errors, or would they be equally viable? Uh, so there's a few different options. Uh, NTRUE uh, has comparable uh, parameter sizes, sometimes smaller, um, but is patented. Um, there is uh, error correcting codes, which uh, I think are a bit larger. Learning with errors, not the ring learning with errors, but plain learning with errors, requires much larger key sizes. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Douglas again.